it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Simon. Simon will talk about uh, the Z at the uh, attack proxy. You can just see that there are slightly change between uh, the content and the title from the conference brochure. But Simon will make some announcements on the new version of uh, Zap and some other stuff, interesting stuff. So I give the floor to Simon. So please. Simon. Hi, folks. How are you doing? Right. Uh, my name is Simon Bennett. I'm the project lead for the OWASP Z Attack Proxy, and I'm a member of the Mozilla security team. Uh, right, my plan is to first give a quick introduction to Zap for people who don't know it very well. Then I want to spend a little bit longer talking about uh, the latest version of Zap, which is 2.4.0. And after that, um, I want to talk about stuff which is coming later, uh, which is unusual because I don't normally talk about things we're going to do as opposed to things we've already done. Uh, so first, a couple of questions for you. Uh, has anyone here used Zap? Ooh, a lot of you. That's great. Uh, and how many of you used um, the latest version, 2.4.0? A lot fewer. To, right. Update. Please update. <laughs> uh, and I'll show you why in a minute. So, very quickly, uh, what is Zap? Um, so, and I'll now start my timer, which I completely forgot to do. Um, so, what is Zap? Zap is a tool for finding vulnerabilities in web applications. Uh, so, it is, it is a hacking tool. It is completely free and open source, like all OWASP projects. And it is an OWASP flagship project. So the flagship projects are those are the ones which are most mature and most suitable for um, people to adopt. And uh, people have been telling me that Zap is um, becoming better known. And I think it's, some people are telling me it's becoming as well known as the OWASP top 10 now, uh, which, is, uh, which is very good news. I can't verify that, but uh, that's the impression. But that's what people are telling me. So it is a tool that is intended to be ideal for beginners. Uh, that's how I, st I started Zap. Uh, I was definitely a beginner myself, and I wanted to learn about um, application security. Uh, so it's, and we still want to make sure it is a really good tool for beginners. But it's also um, being used a lot by security professionals. So we're actually trying to go for the whole range from beginners right up to the pros. But it's also uh, ideal for developers and you know, functional testers, especially for automated security tests. I'm not going to talk about that a lot uh, this time, but uh, I will be, I'll be mentioning it, and I've mentioned it, and I've talked about it in other talks, and apparently in one of the DevOps tracks uh, later on this afternoon, someone's talking about this kind of thing and mentioning Zap a lot, which is great. It is included in all the major security distributions like Kali, uh, and it's been the top one or two in the Toolswatch top security tools of the last couple of years, which is really good. And as of May, uh, it's now on the ThoughtWorks technology radar, uh, which is really great. So they're saying that all businesses should be evaluating Zap to see how well it can work in their business. Uh, but of course, I should always mention that, you know, as I'm sure you all know, in the security business, there are no silver bullets, so Zap certainly isn't one of those. So we do have some principles, which makes us a little bit different from some commercial projects. <laughs> It is free, open source, as I've mentioned before. And I want to stress this, and I want to stress that there is no pro version. There will never be a pro version. And one of the reasons I stress that is Zap is very much a community project. We actively want people to get involved. It is all about learning about security, and you can do that by using Zap. But you'd also get, get, um, learn about security by getting involved and actually making changes and enhancing and seeing how Zap works and going, well, this could work better. and, and you know learning that way. So, and the, one of the reasons I always stress there'll be no pro version is so that you know if you contribute to Zap, then we won't take your hard work and go, oh, thank you very much, you know, we'll, we'll now sell this. We're not going to do that. It is cross-platform, um, so you know, all you need is Java 7, uh, so it will run on all the main platforms. I've even got it running on a Raspberry Pi. Uh, so, you know, it wasn't that fast, but uh, it still worked. And we aim it to be easy to use. Now, this is, um, there are some caveats here. Security by nature is not exactly um, obvious and intuitive. So a security tool will never be completely obvious and completely easy to use. But we aim to make it as easy to use as possible. And that's not only for beginners. You know, even 
as I learn more and more, I still want the tools I use to, to be easy and intuitive and to help me. Uh, but that means that if you have problems with Zap, with, the, with usability problems with Zap, then please report them, and we treat usability issues just as seriously as functional issues. And it's easy to install as well. Uh, I've played with a lot of security tools, and some of them are such a complete nightmare with all the dependencies and things. You know, actually getting them up and running can be uh, very difficult. And you know, we try and make sure that Zap it, I mean, all you need is Java 7, and then you can get Zap running. And the Mac um, version actually comes with Java 7, so it's uh, very straightforward. Uh, it is internationalized, and again, this is um, very unusual for security tools, including commercial ones, uh, so it is completely internationalized, and it is fully documented. Uh, there's another caveat with that. The documentation has mostly been written by the developers, including myself, and, you know, we're not technical authors, so the documentation could definitely better, be better, but there's a lot of documentation around. We have a user guide, which is included with Zap, and that's also online. We've, we just um, do some processing on that, so it um, keeps in step, uh, and there's a lot of information on the wiki, but yes, there's still a lot of things we could and should document and document better. We aim at uh, Zap to work well with other tools. We know Zap isn't the be-all and end-all, so we try and make sure that we can uh, interact with tools, we can launch tools, and other tools can use Zap. Uh, so that's very important for us, and we're very happy to make changes to make that easier, even if it doesn't directly benefit Zap. The fact that we're working with other tools and other tools are using us is definitely a benefit. So if you're trying to use Zap, uh, integrating with other tools, and you have problems, let us know, and we'll try and help out. And also, we try and reuse well-regarded components. Um, so we don't reinvent the wheel unless we actually have to. You know, we want to take really good open source out there and reuse it rather than you know, maintaining our own version. Uh, but you know, we will do that. And in some cases, we've created new things, and we've made them into components that other tools can use. And in some cases, we've actually deliberately licensed them so that they can be used by commercial tools. So reuse is very important, both that we reuse things and that other t um, people can reuse the stuff we generate. Some statistics for you. Uh, so Zap is nearly five years old, uh, so it's getting there. And we, the most recent release, 2.4.0, we released last month. And I just checked this morning, that's been downloaded more, more than 32,000 times, which isn't too bad in one month. And that's direct downloads as opposed to th um, tools like Kali um, updated very quickly. So people using Zap through Kali will pull that down from the Kali um, repos rather than ours. It is being translated into 30 languages. Actually, I think it's 31 now, and I just got an email from somebody else this morning saying I'd, they'd like to translate it into another language, which is really great. So we'll be 32 soon, and we've got over 130 translators. Uh, so that's something I'm really proud of and something I think is really great. And it's, that's a very important thing. We, um, we want contributions from, in all, all aspects, whether it's documentation, translating, so it's not just code contributions we're interested in. Um, testing, all these things are really great. And, I'm not sure about this, but I kind of get the impression it's actually mostly professional pen testers using it. I could be wrong. It's difficult for us to know exactly who's using it. Uh, but based on the, the feedback we get and some of the issues that are raised, I'm guessing it's pro pen testers. But maybe it's just that the developers and QA people are finding it does exactly what they need. I'm not sure. Uh, and finally, uh, I don't see this so much, but I used to see something saying, oh, Zap's just a fork of Paros. I did some quick calculations, and the version that we release, so 2.4.0, not including all the stuff on the marketplace, um, only 20% of that is the original Paros code, and 80% is new Zap code. I've got a few more statistics for you. So there's a site called Open Hub, and Zap is counted as very high activity on there, so it's actually right up there with the Linux kernel uh, and Firefox. Um, so it is very active. It's the most active OWASP project on there. Apparently, we've had 60 code contributors, 31 of whom are active. So we take the translators and um, all the evangelists. We've got over 200 um, contributors, which I think is really great. And apparently, it took 347 years of effort. I'm not quite sure how they calculate that. I'm sure I haven't done any more than uh, 100 years on it myself. So, uh, last thing I want to go through on the introduction is some use cases. Uh, that we want to make sure that Zap can be used in as many different ways as possible, um, whatever, you know, whatever works for you, really. So you can use it as a point-and-shoot tool. Uh, you, know, you just enter a URL, and it'll go, and it'll spider the, the um, site, and then do the active and passive scanning. This works very well, unless you've got something like authentication, in which case you're going to be hitting the login page. Uh, so obviously, there are some restrictions to that. 
Um, you know, what we tend to recommend is proxying via Zaps, so exploring the web application manually um, with your browser proxying through Zaps, so you can explore the application and you can put sensible values, you can explore, you know, hopefully the application is designed for humans, um, so you'll understand it and you'll understand it more as you explore it and you'll then teach Zap about it and the better you explore the application, the better Zap can scan it. Um, so manual proxying and then scanning is a very good step. Obviously, we've got the manual pen testing, so the pro pen testers, if that's just a starting point. After that, there's loads of um, manual tools to play around things. You know, the, if you're doing professional pen testing, you want to automate as much as possible so you can concentrate your manual effort and your brain power on the things that automated scanners like Zap just can't find. Uh, but I also think automated security regression tests are a very important aspect of Zap. So this is where instead of having somebody sitting there and exploring the application, you use your uh, automated uh, your regression tests to explore your application. So this is something you can actually include in your continuous integration. So you do all your functional tests, proxying those through, the, through Zap. You get your functional testing, and then Zap can do security regression testing on top of that. And if you do that as part of continuous integration, it means, you know, within a minutes or hours of someone actually committing a change, you can get an alert saying there's now a cross-site scripting vulnerability because someone forgot to escape one variable on a web page. So that's, you know, and the sooner we can catch these vulnerabilities, the better. You can actually use Zap as a debugger. Um, so I've used that, you know, when you're playing around with JavaScript libraries or WebSockets. You know, if you're having problems with your, when you're developing a website uh, and you want to see what's going on, you can use Zap. And if you're finding out you're sending the wrong thing, you can change things mid-flight, you know, whether it's WebSockets or you can even do it with some of the client-side messages as well, rather than actually go and change the code and recompile and redeploy. You can actually go, well, I'll just change it on the fly and make sure I get it right. Then when it's working, okay, then you can change code, the code and uh, go from there. So that's um, very important. And also, uh, I've said before, Zap isn't the be-all and end-all. Uh, and there are, a lot of, there are quite a few tools. There's a growing number of tools, including things like ThreadFix and Minion, which have a wider scope than just scanning individual web applications. Uh, and they make use of Zap very heavily. Um, so this is a very important use case for us. So what I'd like to do now is talk about the latest version of Zap 2.4.0. And uh, rather than just talk about it, I think I'll try and show you some of the things. So this is Zap. And if you haven't used this version before, you'll notice that there was actually a splash screen. That's new. And there are some tips and tricks that come up um, when you are on the splash screen for you to read. Unfortunately, Zap is actually starting about, uh, about half the speed it used to. Um, so it's, it's twice as fast to start up. And that means it's, you don't have as much time to read the tips and tricks. Um, you can access them via the help menu as well. Then what you get is this um, dialogue asking you about whether you want to persist the Zap session. Um, we've done this um, because we found that a lot of people were um, starting up Zap, they were then exploring the applicant, doing the, all the pen testing, and then they were saving the result at the end. Now, this isn't actually the best way to use Zap, because what happens is Zap stores everything it does in the database. And even if you're not persisting the um, session, it will store it in a database anyway, but when you, um, if you choose not to persist it, that database will get trashed um, when you exit Zap. When you save it or persist it, then it actually gets copied to another place. So the most efficient, the best way to use Zap is actually to persist, persist the session at the start. Um, and that way, if on the unlikely event Zap crashes or your PC crashes, then you'll actually have everything be saved up to that point. Um, and if you save it, if you do a load of work and you find actually as you know, thousands or tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of requests, when you save the session, actually copying those files takes time. So the, the best thing to do is to actually save the session at the start. So we've got two options. You can say exactly where you want to save it. You can save it in the um, standard place with the, with the timestamp. Or you can choose not to save it at all, persist it at all. And you can later on choose to persist it. And if you have persisted it, then you can actually delete the session when you exit as well, if you'd like. So that was the first thing you might have noticed. Second thing is, um, now I've kind of, hopefully you can read Zap at the back. I've tried to um, change the resolution so it's a bit clearer. Um, on, usually I'd have it at a lower resolution so you can see more. Uh, but, but one thing you'll notice is there are a lot fewer tabs than there used to be. Now, don't worry, we haven't uh, got rid of a load of functionality. But what we found is all the different tabs and options were quite intimidating to new users. 
And we also found that uh, even experienced people using Zap tended to use um, particular functions at, at one time. So they wouldn't use everything. They'd just concentrate in particular areas. And so this mass of tabs didn't help at all. So what we've done is we tried to cut it down to the absolute essential. And uh, actually, normally, the scripts tab isn't one of the ones which comes up. So you'd see it would be much more like that. And what you'll see is we have these um, magic plus icons. And these are all of the other tabs that are available. So you can go in and add any of these ones you like. And we've got a couple of buttons here. So here's a button which um, shows all of the tabs. So that's the full set of tabs that you get as default for 2.40. Now, that's, you know, we've got the Zap Marketplace, the online marketplace. You can pull down loads and loads more um, add-ons. Uh, but we've also got another option here for hiding the unpinned tabs. And the, that pinning thing is important because, say, you always want the scripts tab. So you can add the script tab, and all of the tabs that aren't um, shown by default have this little pin icon. You can pin them, and then it doesn't matter if you show all the tabs and then hide the tabs, that the pinned ones will still stay. And what we try and do is make sure that um, tabs appear when required. So I do like, a quick attack. the right URL. Then you'll see down there the spider tab appeared, and then the active scan tab will appear. So basically, the tabs appear as and when required. So if you set a breakpoint, then you'll get a breakpoint tab. It's actually quite good, because I noticed I was um, exploring a web website, and suddenly the web sockets tab appeared. So it suddenly makes it much more obvious um, when these things happen. Uh, so that, that's the tabs. And the other thing you might notice is we have, on the Sites tree, we've got this new toolbar, and we've got context there as well. And the reason we've put context there is they're actually very important. And oh, I'll ask this question here. How many people here have used contexts? A few, but not very many. Right, if you've not used context with Zap, you haven't used Zap very much. Because uh, there's contexts are very important. And they're very important because they allow us to uh, define and different characteristics of your application. So I'll have, have a look here. And what we can do is we can actually just get, we've got um, ones for importing, exporting context. And we've just got a new context dialog here. And you can still go to the sites tree and right click on nodes um, to add them to the context. But what we can do, we can do them this way. I'm going to define budget as the context. And also picks a sensible name. And one thing, so we've now got this new budget context. And you'll see it's got the um, little target icon. And that means it's in scope. So I can actually right click on the context and remove from scope and add it back in. So you can do this very quickly. And if you double click on the context, then what you see is you'll see all this extra information that you can actually associate with a context. So Contexts are defined by sets of URLs. You can um, URL patterns that you can include and exclude. But then things like the structure. So if you have um, things like the unusual you know, separators, or if you have um, single page applications, this is where you tell Zap about your application, how it works. Technology. So if you actually know what technology is behind your site, then you can tell Zap. Um, and that's very good because you can say, right, well, we don't have, you know, it's running on Windows. There's no point in doing injection attacks on um, Linux and Mac. Um, so you can make things, make that more efficient. You can do authentication, users. Uh, you, you know, there's loads of things you can actually define to do with those applications. So context is very important. That's one, one of the reasons we've got those there. Uh, next thing I want to talk about is the scan dialogues. So this is how we actually launch attacks. So we've had this, um, if you have, there are various ways of launching attacks. Uh, but one of the standard ways is right-clicking on a node, and you've got this attack um, pay, uh, menu here. And this is what we were finding is we were putting more and more options in this uh, attack menu. It was getting bigger and bigger, and the combinations were getting awkward. So you'll see what we've got is, apart from the force browse, which we've still got to do, um, they're just single items for the main things. So if you look at the spider, then what we get, you launch it, we get a, a dialogue launched. And normally, you won't see the advanced um, options. So what you'll see is you just have a very simple thing. We've got the starting point. 
Um, if you've got multiple contexts, you can choose those there. If you've defined the context and the users, then you can actually choose which user you want to spider as. So these are, and you know, do you want to uh, recur uh, recurse down the, the known nodes so to, to actually use those as starting points all the way through the spider? So that's kind of the essential information. Uh, and if you're new to Zap, this is, you know, that's all you need, hopefully. Um, but what you can do is you've got these advanced op options, and then we go in and you can start defining loads of extra things. So, you know, the crawl depth, exactly what, you know, do you want to actually um, parse Git metadata? Lots of um, more advanced things which allow you to tune the spider exactly how you like. And so we got those for most of the dial attack dialogues. So if you go something like the active scanner, um, again, we've got the basic, basic stuff there. Um, scan policy, which I will mention uh, very shortly, and we've got these advanced dialogues, and you can go and you can say, right, exactly which input vectors, you know, uh, are the parameters you want the sc um, scanner to ignore because they're standard ones generated by a framework. Custom vectors, so you actually define exactly which strings you want to um, scan, and you can disable the non-custom ones and say, I just want to, to attack this string on this um, request. Technology again, so this overrides, you know, if you define the technology in the context, all well and good, but then you can override it if you want to scan for one particular technology, and the policy, and, uh, which I'll come to uh, in a minute. And then we go into have a very quick look at the, something like, so the Ajax spider, again, same kind of thing, very quick, you know, we've got options like you can choose which browser you want to use now, and we've got advanced options which allow you to go in and choose exactly how many you launch, what the scroll depth is. So the idea is what we're trying to do is make it um, as easy as possible for people new to Zap, not overwhelm them, but once you're comfortable with it, you can choose these advanced options and do much more fun things. And the one thing I mentioned there was scan policy. We used to have one scan policy, um, and now we have this scan policy manager. And the idea is the scan policy defines the active scan rules and how those work. Um, and we've got very fine grain control. Um, so we have a just look at the default policy here. What you'll see is you can change loads and loads of aspects about it. So you can define the threshold. And this is the threshold at which we report alerts. So you can choose to report fewer alerts. So you've got more chance of uh, false negatives but less false positives. You can go the other way. So you have more chance of false positives and less than false negatives. Hopefully the medium level is vaguely sensible. And then attack strength. You know, how many attacks do you want to do? The more attacks, the more chance of finding things, but the longer things it'll take. So you can actually choose right low level where it's something like six attacks per parameter per page, um, medium is something like 12, high around the 24, and we got insane as well, um, and that's potentially hundreds of attacks per parameter per page. Uh, you don't want to do an insane attack on a, a large web app on everything. But what you can do is you can choose, right, actually I don't want to do any of these in this particular policy, so turn all of those off, but if we look at injection, I just want to do parameter um, tampering, at uh, insane level. So you can define these policies, and these policies will, uh, you know, so you can have as many of those, and what you might have noticed is with the attack active scan, then what you could do is if you had the basic options, you could choose which policy you wanted, and if you go into the advanced options, then you can actually choose a policy. You can fine tune it for that particular attack. And the last thing on this side I want to mention is a new mode. So for those of you who don't, haven't used modes before, um, we have different modes, different ways that Zap works. We have the safe mode. Safe mode's boring. Doesn't allow you to do anything nasty. Uh, that can actually be very good. So if you've got a production website and you want to see what's going on, you want to intercept things, and you just want to make sure you really don't mess things up, then use safe mode. You, know, you won't be able to do anything bad, but you can still see what's going on. So that's very useful uh, for that. Then we have protected mode, and this is probably the best one for most people to use most of the time, or it used to be anyway. And protected mode, you can't do anything bad until you define something that's in scope. So if we have a look, if I go into protected mode now, and if I try and, if I right click the top node, you'll see that all of these things are grayed out. Whereas if I go to budget, because that's in scope, you can now do bad things. Uh, so that's protected mode, it's a good one. We'd like to put it in protected mode to start with, but then 
no one would be able to do anything until they defined something in scope and they'd claim it didn't work. So we can't do that. So we have standard mode, which just means, yeah, you can do anything all the time. But then we have this new mode, which is attack mode. And what attack mode does, it kind of follows you. So rather than, you know, what you normally do is you explore the application, maybe use the spider, uh, but what, uh, and then do the active scan. But what the attack mode does is it kind of follows you. So as soon as you find new um, <coughs> contents of your website, it starts attacking them. So it's kind of ongoing active scan. And that means it kind of follows you around the site. And so you can actually just choose to uh, attack particular things and ignore whole areas of the site. Um, and that, that way, you can you know, focus on particular areas and not go down to admins or whatever bits you don't want to, to do. And the last thing I'd like to show um, in 240 is we have this new, di this new uh, dialogue for fuzzing. So we did have, um, a f we've had a fuzzer before, uh, and that allowed you to fuzz one particular string at one time, and it allowed you to choose uh, which of the file, you know, files of attack vectors that you would use, which is all well and good, but it was a little bit restrictive. And it's the, we've had some user surveys, and this is the thing that most people have requested um, that we, we enhance. So we now have um, these fuzz locations. So you can actually go in and say, right, this particular string there, I want to fuzz that. And then you can choose the payloads. So you can say, right, a file. I want to choose one particular file as kind of one-off thing. Um, and you can say what the comments are, in a load of options around that. You can choose the file fuzzers. So these are the um, f file, files of fuzz attacks that we've got built in or that you've added via add-ons. And you can choose as many of these as you like. So you can select a whole range of those. We also have regex expression. So you can put a regex expression. This is experimental. There are, we do know of a, a couple of problems with this, so use this with care. Uh, but we have strings, so you can just have a set of strings, um, new line um, separated. So you can just paste a load of attacks in there if you want. And we also have scripts. And this is very important because uh, what we try and do is make Zap as scriptable as possible. So you can now write a script which generates payloads. And that script can do whatever you like. And it's supported you know, any of the languages that Zap supports, so JavaScript. Uh, and we've got um, you, things like Python and Ruby, uh, Jython and JRuby. Uh, but because Zap uses uh, the JavaScripting, any of the JSR223 languages you should be able to use. Uh, and then what you can do, so what you can actually do is you can define as many of these things you want, and you can have multiple payloads, so you can have write a load of strings, and then I want to choose one of these um, sets of files, and you can add those, and once you've done that, um, so you can actually go in and you can define um, processors. So what the processes are is these actually process the, uh, either the attack payload, uh, so the attack payload, you can do things like encoding and decoding, escaping, unescaping, a um, whole load of things that you can apply to the payloads, and also scripts. So we've got script, um, script processes, so you can write a script that will change the payload in any way. So you've got a custom app which does, has some weird encoding. You can write a script for that, and then you can make sure that all of the attacks are encoded in the right way. So we have a huge amount of options there, um, and it's really powerful. I think it's only limited by your imagination. If there's anything in there that, you, uh, that isn't supported and you think should be, let us know and we'll be very happy to add it in. Uh, we've got loads of options, so a number of threads, um, a delay if you find out you're um, DDoSing your, uh, or, or dosing your application, lots of things there, and different, you know, how the, how we, whether you go depth first or breadth first. And we've also got message processors. So not only can you use scripts to generate the payloads, scripts to manipulate and encode and decode the payloads, we can also um, add p p um, message processors, and we've got some built-in ones. Um, so things like uh, detecting that the attack's been reflected, um, updating the content length, um, and scripts as well. So you can actually um, write scripts which manipulate the messages. So this means um, you will, the scripts will get invoked both on the request and response. You will have full access to everything. You can make any changes you like. Um, so this is exceedingly powerful. Uh, and we think it is, uh, 
There's loads of fun things, and I would love to see some people come up with some fun scripts. Uh, so please play around with this, and let us know if there's anything missing, anything wrong, or if you come up with some cool scripts. And we've got the community scripts, uh, which, you know, so just send us pull requests. So that was uh, a quick overview of version 2.4.0. Uh, one thing I haven't mentioned is the API changes. So we have this REST API, and there's loads more you can do with the API. The idea is once you've be able to use the API for pretty much everything that Zap can do. Uh, so you can now kick off. You've always been able to start the spider and active scanner, but now you can start multiple ones of those and have them running concurrently. But there's loads more features you can access via the API. And if there's anything mess missing, then let us know, and we'll put it in. And lots and lots of uh, minor enhancements and bug fixes. Have a look at the release notes fully for the full list. So uh, there, are, is, there are a few other new things. So we've got some new alpha add-ons. Uh, one I'm particularly excited about is access control testing. And this is something one of our core developers has been working on for quite a few years, actually. And it's all about testing, the automated testing of access control. And that is possible to some extent if your um, application understands things like um, you know, you have to understand authentication, session handling, um, users, uh, but Zap understands all of those things. If you tell Zap how these things work, then you will actually, you'll be able to, do, you know, there's, Zap will actually understand how these things work, and you'll be able to do, um, Zap will be able to crawl um, the application uh, and understand the differences between users, and then do the attacks based on the different users between them. So we actually can automate a whole load of access control testing. Um, there's sequence scanning, uh, which means you can actually, um, you know, have, if you've got pages, if you've got um, wizards, um, which you have to go through page one, page two, page three, we can actually make sure that you, you know, attack page three properly by going through the first few pages. And, and I mentioned there the community scripts, uh, which allow you to, which, you know, anyone can contribute to. So you want to build up a great um, resource there of fun things. So, what's next? Um, one thing, I've, I don't normally talk about things that are coming up uh, because, you know, it's a little bit uh, risky, particularly with an open source project and uh, contributors don't know what's going to happen. Uh, but I want to make a, a change this time. Um, there will be more of the same. So, you know, we've got a bug fix release coming out soon. Soon, I said, I'm not going to give a date. We'll see, you know, there's nothing critical we've got to fix. We know of a few things. Uh, it'll be within the next few weeks, probably. Uh, then we're going to have new, improved active, active and passive scan rules. People are working on those. New and improved add-ons. There'll be some fun things coming along soon. We are migrating to GitHub. This is painful. Uh, we were on Google Code, which is shutting down. So GitHub, we're going to be getting there. Uh, but that takes a while. Um, we'll probably have to adopt a um, dependency management tool as well. So that's all well and good, but nothing too surprising. Uh, but I did say, uh, I've said on Twitter that I did want to announce something. So I don't want to disappoint. Um, and what I want to talk about is a new direction for Zap. And the reason for this direction is we want to make sure that Zap is, uh, works as well as possible in all situations. And we've had some requests for things where Zap doesn't really cope with that well at the moment. And this new direction is something we're calling internally Zas, Zap as a service. So what we want to do is take, instead of having Zap as a desktop tool, to put it on the servers. And I want to stress that this is not a replacement you know, we're not getting rid of the desktop zap, as I'm now calling it. Desktop zap will carry on, um, and it will be a really big focus for us. And a lot of people, most people, carry on using um, desktop zap, hopefully. But we want a new way of running zap, and that is running zap as a service. So what does this really mean? What's the, what are the implications? Well, one of the things is a load of the zap functionality will just work. So, you know, all of the active scan, passive scan rules, they don't care where they're running. A lot of the zapped functionality uh, will be common across these two things. Let's think about the properties of what I'm now calling desktop zap. We have a local HSQL DB, which is all well and good. It's great. You don't have to install it. Um, but it's, you know, all very good for a desktop tool. We build up data structures in the database and in memory. Um, so, you know, all things like the sites tree, that's completely in memory. Uh, and th that's the kind of things you want for uh, a desktop tool where you're seeing, you know, the, the tree scrolling and things of fast UI. That's very necessary. You've got one process on a single machine, one user, super user essentially for the application, and you access it via Swing UI or the API. And we typically expect Zap to be running for a matter of you know, minutes, hours, 
but days, weeks is not too likely. Uh, and the license is Apache V2, it means you can take Zap and you can do whatever you want with it, uh, which is all well and good. So, Zap as a service. What prop what's the difference between that and desktop Zap? Well, the first thing is we need an enterprise uh, database, uh, something, you know, MySQL, something like that, but something big and robust. We need to make sure that all the data structures are built up in the database. None of the big ones are built up in memory because that just doesn't scale. We want multiple processes. We want to be, that to be distributed. We want multiple users and multiple roles, so a hierarchy of roles within Zap so you can, uh, different people can have different permissions and different target applications. The access will be via a web UI as well as the API. Uh, so that's going to be a, a big change for us. And the application lifetime. This is the big one. What we're aiming for is five nines compatibility. Now, for those of you who haven't heard the term before, five nines is a term given to um, an uptime of 99.99%. That means in one year, you're allowed five minutes downtime. That's quite big. That's quite a big change from a desktop tool that we're used to running for a matter of hours. That's a huge change. Uh, so, you know, this is, there's a lot of work here, but the, particularly the, the lifetime thing is massive. Uh, so I don't want to uh, underestimate the amount of work that's going to be involved here. There's a lot of things to do. And I want to, you know, people have said, pointed out to me, it's like, you know, do you really know what you're doing? And that's a very good question. But my answer is, uh, you know, I still think of myself as new to application security. I've been doing it for like five years now. I'm still learning a lot, uh, learning a lot in everything, of course. Uh, but what I used to do before this, I was a developer, and I designed, I implemented, and in some cases, I ran systems like this. So this, bizarrely, this is actually me getting back to my comfort zone. So I've got, you know, I think I know what's required. It's a lot of work. Um, and the last thing is the license, Apache V2. This means you can do what you like with it. You can take Zap as a service. You can put it online. You can charge for it. That's fine. We're, we're cool with that. So what do we actually need to do? Uh, we need to introduce a database independence layer. HSQLDB is actually really good for the desktop. There's no point in you know We don't want to say you've got to install MySQL or something. Um, so we want to be able to switch between um, databases, uh, config, and but we also want to definitely support MySQL as well as other things. Uh, we want a low memory option. Uh, again, this is something you probably won't want to the desktop, but for on the server, you definitely want to build everything up within um, database tables, essentially. Want a multi-process option. Again, on the desktop, we'll stick with one process probably, but you know, we want these um, distributed processes across multiple, you know, multiple servers, multiple, um, uh, a whole range of uh, you know, different data centers, things like that. Um, and we want to support multiple users and roles, which is another biggie. And there's a whole load of things, scheduling and managing sessions, and there's, there's massive things in there. Uh, and we need to um, develop a web UI. So that's pretty significant. Um, and we're going to need a full security review. Uh, you know, we try and make sure that desktop Zap is secure for Zap users, uh, but we're well aware that it's a tiny target compared with an online service. People are really going to have a hard go at that. Uh, you know, it's got all the vulnerabilities for you know, your company. You de we definitely want to make sure that this is as secure as possible. So that's, there are a lot of changes in there. Uh, I don't want to you know, m pretend that it's uh, you know, very quick. This will take us a long time. I'm not going to give you any estimate when we're going to complete, because it depends how many people can get involved, how quickly they can work. Um, and if you want to get involved, please get in touch. But we have done some of this already. So version 2.4.0 has the database independence layer. It doesn't, you know, there's only one implementation, which is the original Paros um, HSQL DB implementation. But in the trunk, we have another implementation. We have a second implementation, which is a generic SQL layer. And that supports MySQL as well as HSQLDB. And at some point, we'll be changing over to that. So all we've done is we've taken all the SQL statements, we've extracted those into, messages, uh, into property files. So you can actually just change the syntax um, of the SQL to match your database, and then you'll support that database. And we also have support for the low memory option in the core. So this means that the main data structures we can build up in the database, in particular the sites tree. So the sites tree did just build up all of the sites and every um, node would just carry on building up. That is now, we can build that up in the, in the database rather than in memory. 
Um, for desktops app, you probably want it in memory still. Uh, but you know, we now have this option, so you can actually run Zap in a low memory option, probably with the API is better. You can run it with the UI, you just don't get the sites tree now. Uh, and before we get too excited, I'm not gonna go anymore, we haven't done anything else. But one thing, you, know, you don't actually have to worry about, you know, it's not a big bang where we say, right, you can't use anything until we've actually finished the whole lot. Things like uh, MySQL support could actually be really useful for desktop app. So that I actually use it quite a bit myself. Um, we suddenly, we had this app summit yesterday. We had, suddenly had a thought that we could actually have um, multiple um, desktop apps all talking to the same MySQL server. So if you've got multiple pen testers all working on the same applications, you can share the database and see what the other people are doing. So you know, there's features which will bleed across into this desktop Zap, and there'll be cases where you can actually um, use these things before Zap as a service is complete. So the low memory option would be ideal. If you're just using the Zap API, then you know, through ThreadFix or Minion or through other tools, you, you can start using the low memory option even though we haven't got multiple processes. And we can start using MySQL across multiple desktops even though we don't have multi-process. So there's a lot of things that will be coming, and they're already there, you can start, make use, start making use of. And that is everything I've got to say. So who's got the first question? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so we've had feedback from users, we've, um, and actually in Mozilla, we want to use it as well. So we want to set up a Zap as a service so that all of our developers and QA people can use that. So we want an online service for Mozilla, uh, and we, all, we also you know, recognize that uh, other users want to do the same kind of thing. So this is something I said you, you could set up within your company, or you could put it on the internet and start charging for it. That's fine. Any more questions? Yeah. About policies, um, when I use SAP, I always look at the policies, try to customize the policies. Yeah. Custom policies, customization. Um, I remember it was a policy about almost top 10, this is not almost top 10, right? Uh, we've not had one of those. I think the, the top 10 is, uh, it's kind of, I mean, if you ever see online a web scanner saying, we, we detect the top 10, they're lying. Uh, the top 10 is, it's kind of, it's more conceptual and there are certain things like injection attacks, but some of the other ones, some of the session handling, and it's like, you know, uh, things like whether things are encrypted in the database. Well, you can't usually tell that unless your application is particularly buggy, you know, how data is encrypted in the database. So there's a lot of things that you can't detect automatically. We could have a kind of top 10, but it would be limited. Um, you know, there's, uh, there's certain ones in the top 10 that are so difficult, so in some cases so wide-ranging, like misconfiguration, that covers such a multitude of sins, and some of the session handling in you know, the top 10, it's like, well, that, there's so many things that could cover. So we could come up with a kind of nearly top 10 policy, but at the moment we haven't, uh, but if anyone, uh, you know, I kind of think it's you tune it to your applications, so what's probably good, if you've got an application, you're scanning, scanning regularly, scan that application, and then, you know, if there's certain things where, you know, particularly technology, or if you know your application doesn't do certain things, you don't have to use those rules. You know, there's no point in, as I said, um, testing for um, Windows vulnerabilities if you're not using Windows. Uh, and then things like, you know, there's certain things you really want to test for, so you might you know, test for cross-site scripting at a high level, some ones where you get some false positives, you can actually put the, um, the, you know, turn that down a bit. So it's really for tuning to particular applications or particular things you're looking for. So you might say, right, when a developer checks things in, um, we're doing a continuous integration scan, these are just, I just want to run these three rules and then we'll do the full set afterwards. Or the, the um, attack mode. You can actually have a separate um, policy for the attack mode. So rather than do everything, you just want to you know, hit it with a few um, t attacks just so you get the, you know, the injection attacks, maybe. That, that might be a good one. So it's tuning it to how you'd like. But if you come up with really great policies you think um, other people will be interested in, yeah, post them to the user group or something like that. Tell us, and we'll, we can build up a list of these things. It'd be great. But I, I don't know how easy it is to come up. We try and have the default values sensible. Um, so, you know, will someone come up with a policy that's really applicable to loads of other users? If so, great, and we'll publicize it. It's good to have templates as well. Yeah, but if we can come up with templates, we're really happy to include them with Zap. So if you come up with some useful ones, let us know. 
and the scripts actually, the scripts, so the community scripts are organized in certain ways. If you install those, if you pull those down from GitHub, you can actually point to Zap2 and all of those will get imported. So you can import collections of scripts. So you can have, if you've got a pen test company, you've got a load of your own scripts, you could have those in another repo, a private one maybe, um, pull those from there and all of those will get added to Zap. Um, so you can do fun things like that as well. Any other questions? Yeah. If you would uh, uh, want to release uh, Zap as a service next year at the same time as this conference, what would be the amount of work and people involved involved to get this done? Uh, no, I'm not going down there. <laughs> it's it's a lot of work, uh, and it's going to be iterative. Um, so, and you know, when it comes down to it, I'm, you know, Mozilla sponsored me to work on Zap. Most of my work is on Zap. Other, I've now found out a few other companies are sponsoring their employees to work on Zap. But it's, you know, I spend a lot of my time. They spend a very small amount of the time. Most of the Zap um, people are contributors uh, and, and doing it in their own time. So sometimes they can spend you know, a decent amount. Sometimes something will happen, you know, family events or something, they change in circumstance, and suddenly they can't contribute at all. So it's really difficult to do you know, it. You know, if I had a team of half a dozen people working full time, um, then I think I'd be able to give you a better idea, um, but I don't, so um, <laughs> I'm going to uh, sidestep that question. Good question, but very difficult for me to answer. But the idea, what we're trying to do is do features at a time. As I said, do features which you can actually make use of. So um, I'm going to be publicizing soon how you can actually use MySQL, because I, I use Zap with MySQL sometimes on my Linux box. So and that's it. then you actually have all the sessions in one database. So that can, and, you know, things like having these multiple desktops all, to, all talking to the same um, database and then sharing information. You know, we can implement that before the full um, Zap as a service, and that will be really useful. So uh, we're trying to do things one step at a time and have useful things, but things people can, you know, use in anger. No more questions? All right, I will be around um, afterwards, and I'll be here for the rest of the conference. So please come up. If you're using Zap, come up and let me know. Uh, if you've got any suggestions uh, or criticism, you know, things we could do better, please let me know. Thank you very much. <laughs>